We're going to give it another moment to allow folks to come on in and then we'll get started. All right, let's do this. Good evening and a welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight Bookstore and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Hawa Allen presenting her new book, Insurrection, Rebellion, Civil Rights and the Paradoxical State of Black Citizenship. She will be talking with Anjali Raza Kolb, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thank you to Hawa, Anjali, and the team at WW Norton for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways that you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by either of our panelists, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Insurrection, Rebellion, Civil Rights, and the Paradoxical State of Black Citizenship is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase a Waz book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. The buy link will be in the chat. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Anjali Raza Kolb. Anjali Fatima Raza Kolb is Associate Professor of English at the University of Toronto, where she teaches post-colonial literature and theory and poetry. Her first book, Epidemic Empire, University of Chicago Press 2021, uncovers the history behind the dead metaphor of the terrorism epidemic by looking at documents of public health policy, immigration law, novels, poems, films, and more. Her poems, translations, and essays have appeared in various venues. She will be speaking with our featured author, Hoa Allen. Hoa is an attorney and author whose work has appeared in the Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Review of Books, Latham's Quarterly, and The Baffler, among other publications. She lives and works in New York City. Hawa's new book, Insurrection, is a deeply researched and felt history and critique of the paradoxical state of Black citizenship in the United States. Hawa's traces, Hawa traces the origins of the Insurrection Act of 1807 to our current moment, revealing how the act empowered the federal government to either defend or violate Black enfranchisement at various times throughout history. Insurrection provides a new framework to deepen our understanding of the history of protest, military intervention, and white supremacist terrorism in the United States in Hua's profound, powerful voice. Hua is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she will be talking with Anjali and with all of you. So please take it away. Okay. So here's the book I'm going to be reading from. Keep it in mind in case you see it in the bookstores. Um, so the first passage uh, or the passage, the only passage I'm reading is from chapter one. Um, and 
It is uh, an excerpt of personal narrative and uh, it starts with the sub subtitle, Black Over White. I was a summer associate at a New York law firm that had been bombarding its wide-eyed recruits with a sufficient variety of amusements to distract us from how dull the work was. I had danced around purchase tables and exclusive clubs with champagne flutes in my hand. I had been waited on by waiters who waltzed in synchronized movements around our dining table. I had watched Avenue Q. One afternoon, I was invited via group email to the top floor of the building to hear from a candidate for Senate. A partner had been supporting the Senate hopefuls campaign and was helping him raise funds. So I took a break from researching a very dry memorandum and shot up in the elevator to go check it out. After a brief introduction and a tepid applause from the gathered audience, the candidate stepped to the front of the conference room. I remember listening to standard fare for a political address as a speaker promised what he would do if he was elected. His words weaving some nearby future that all of us in that very room could help bring into existence with our combined civic and financial efforts. What stands out most in my memory, however, is his emphasis on his heritage, which became a refrain of his speech. My mother is from Kansas, he kept saying, and my father is from Kenya. The candidate was eventually interrupted by the partner who had invited him to speak. New York law firms all had personalities, I had been told. This one, though relatively prestigious, was known to be a bit rough and tumble or plainly full of jocks. Accordingly, this man who had been made partner found it fitting to inform the audience, head shaking and hands waving in the air as if preventing a bar brawl, that this man right here was the only candidate who could bring together the voters of Illinois behind a pro progressive platform. This partner should know, after all, he was from there. And as he knew, it was rare for the voters he was familiar with to rally behind a progressive, much less a black. A black? I remember asking angrily, rhetorically. A black what? A black shoe? A black dog? This is what I asked later that afternoon at another one of our scheduled amusements, holding hostage the sympath sympathetic ear of a fellow summer associate. He listened intently, but appeared circumspect about carrying on the conversation. I couldn't blame him. Whenever I gathered with one or, one or more other Black Summer Associates to chit chat in the hallway, I would periodically crane my neck to, see, to check for any disapproving onlookers and was always poised to disperse. In any case, right then in the conference room, I remained silent along with everyone else and simply scanned the other attendees to see if anyone was visibly offended. The candidate was as poker faced as the rest of us. After all, he was there to raise funds and the rest of us were getting paid actual corporate salaries. He did, however, invite all of us to his fundraiser later that night. Later that workday evening, I entered a large event space where Barack Obama's fundraiser was being held. The event was sponsored by an African-American Lawyers Association, one of many such identity groups convened to professionally encourage black lawyers who at the time comprised a single digit percentage of all lawyers in the United States. We still do, only an estimated 5%. Black women make up only 2% of the, of the profession. Though absurdly low, these statistics don't mean anything to me. If equality and diversity are truly noble goals, then they will never amount to any particular number. Having spent a lifetime accustomed to being the only or at most one of, few, one of a few black people in any given room full of white people, I never believed that having more of us there would do anything other than cause alarm for everyone else. Given the widespread presumption in the United States of a white majority, there is an implicit threshold tolerance for diversity. Up to said threshold, my, majorita my majoritarian hosts might view, might view my statistical presence as an extension of benevolence, a reflection of their tolerance and good nature. After this tipping point, my presence would be a threat. I, I attended the fundraiser by myself, drawn by promised networking and the guest of honor. There were hors d'oeuvres, drinking and sporadic dancing before an MC ascended to the spotlighted stage and hushed the crowd. When Obama finally came to the microphone, I didn't necessarily expect innovation. I didn't really have any expectations at all, having just heard him speak that afternoon. But I ended up being very surprised. I stood there and listened to him give the same exact speech that he had given earlier that day with one exception, and that was inflection. My mom is from Kansas and my daddy's from Kenya. He said everything I'd heard before, but in African-American vernacular, English. 
he code switched. And then I'll read two more sections. There are moments in life that are anticipated while wholly unexpected and which while intelligible in the abstract are unintelligible in so-called reality. One such day was November 4th, 2008. I was sitting on the floor of an acquaintance's apartment awaiting the results of the presidential election. It would become a historic day, but I was nonplussed. Having, li having lived through George W. Bush's first presidential contest with the ensuing days of uncertainty, hanging chads and eventual binding decision of the Supreme Court, I had been primed to expect a long night, if not week or month ahead. Even as the numbers continued to be tallied, tipping the weighted scale of electoral votes in the Illinois senator's direction, the logic logical outcome was still denied by my emotional truth. And then it happened. Without much bureaucratic fanfare, Barack Hussein Obama was, a, was proclaimed the 44th president of the United States. The results were definitive and uncontested. What we call history are moments that are accumulated in hindsight, rearranged to betray some narrative coherence and perhaps effective resonance. But that night after the election was called, I felt history as it was happening. That said, I'm not a sentimental per person. In fact, I still have a sullen, sarcastic 14-year-old version of myself defending my underlying sensitivity against any mainstream, mainstream incitement of hope. And yet, that evening, I cried. Barack, Michelle, Malia, and Sasha walking out onto this large stage in various sh varying shades of black and red before a cheering crowd of supporters bypassed my cynicism for the time being. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, I, I now have like 15 more questions from the question. <laughs> Sorry, but, um, let me just start by saying, first of all, thank you, Hawa, for this amazing book. It's like reading it is so much like talking to you. It's fast and it's brilliant and it's conversational and it's informative and it's like deeply theoretical and it's rigorously researched and there's nothing about it that feels like a casual conversation, but everything about it that feels like a good conversation. And oh my gosh, thank you. I will, yeah, I mean, it's hard not to just like, you know, like throw it on the bed and like come and want to hang out with you, but it is very much like <laughs> hanging out with you. Um, and I feel like, I feel like I'm also, because it's unlike a conversation that has the, the patience of unfolding this like gorgeous gem-like structure over, over these beautiful eight chapters. Like it also shows me something else that we don't do when we just riff with each other. So um, like, thank you for years of friendship, but also thank you for this stunning book. Like it's readable. And, and I think, I mean, I just keep texting everyone I know, like, please buy this immediately. And <laughs> I'm holding it up again, because it's also just such a beautiful book. Um, I, in fact, just sent a copy to my partner's mother, um, who's a lawyer and former federal judge, like it's just, it's for kind of for everybody. Um, it's also been, I wanna say for me, like I'm doing, uh, I mean, you and I know we have these kind of parallel research tracks in terms of um, like legal entities that become like non-entities. So the terrorist and the Muslim and, and mm -hmm. um, the paradox of black citizenship. But I also wanna say, I really appreciate how personal the book is. And I've been doing some like really grinding, depressing institutional diversity work over the last couple of months. And like the reminder of insurrection um, and the need for like disobedience and resistance also feels deeply motivating. So let me let me ask you a, a real question and um, and I'll probably keep thinking you again and again. I want to come back to Obama in a little bit. But I want to start because you you chose such an excellent passage. I'm going to hold the book up again. I want to start by asking you about this gorgeous cover. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard you say in other contexts that um, the designers were going for like a 70s horror vibe. And starting with your experience as a summer associate in a big jockey New York law firm is like basically like the the like girl version of get out like I kind of like there is like there's a sense of horror in this book and you also start with this chapter about fear and like it is a legal history but it's also a history of emotion um it's a history of like tribal feeling so I talk to us about this this horror cover I think it could not be better and more appropriate how did it come and how do you feel about it now well, so I, you know, I actually had nothing to do with it other than selecting it or or, or approving it when it was uh, shown to me. But well, okay, let me back up. I did actually um, 
uh, I was asked for cover inspirations. And in my mind, I remember the covers of books in the 1970s, right? Where you'd have these, you know, very ambitious uh, sort of theoretical texts or like very, you know, um, you know, uh, books with, with one word, um, you know, titles. And then you'd have an abstract image on the cover, right? Like that, I mean, that, so that, that was the inspiration that I sent them. And so this is what they came back with, with, with which I actually loved, um, especially since it, it does have not only that sort of vintage 70s sort of book that you might find in the library, like that vibe, but it also has that sort of 70s, like, um, like horror film vibe, which I particularly love because I love film, but in any event. So that, that's like sort of the story about the cover, but when you were, were talking to me about fear, um, you know, and all of the emotional content in the book, that actually came about as a, as a way of solving a craft problem because uh, the way I pitched the book was uh, to discuss the Insurrection Act of 1807 and the incidents to which uh, it was used to largely respond to. So as a, to back up, the Insurrection Act allows a president to deploy federal troops and or federalize the National Guard in order to suppress, you know, civil unrest, you know, domestic violence, unlawful combinations, or insurrections, um, and it's uh, sort of a very exceptional sort of use of domestic military force because it's coming from the federal level as opposed to from the state governor, who typically has, uh, you know, uh, is the commander in chief of the uh, state national guard, you know. So there are very few sort of exceptions where you have the president uh, exercising this power, which they can do he or she, you know, one day can do, um, or they can do uh, either unilaterally or uh, at the request of the state governor. So just that's the encapsulation. The pattern that I found was that in looking at the uh, incidents in which, in history in which the Insurrection Act was used, I saw that, you know, even though I hadn't heard of the Insurrection Act per se, when I started looking into this, I had heard of uh, so many of these other incidents to which it, it had been used to respond to. So the broad brush is that it was used largely to respond to either so-called race riots, right? You know, like the last time it was invoked properly was uh, in 1992 in response to the Los, Ange Los Angeles riot or rebellion, however you want to call it. And then before that, uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, it was used to respond to, you know, the riots that broke out in DC, Baltimore and um, Chicago, and also the Detroit riots of 1967 when there was that long hot summer with all of these riots, right? But it was also, and you know, there's a, the, the history goes far back. I think some, at least one military historian linked the Insurrection Act to uh, the, the dispatch of federal troops to respond to the Nat Turner rebellion, right? So this is a long history. Um, but then you also have the use with respect to um, enforcing civil rights of African-Americans, the most uh, uh, sort of Notorious uh, incidents are the desegregation of public schools in Alabama, Arkansas, and Mississippi. And then you also have the right of civil rights protesters to march from Selma to Montgomery. There was an Insurrection Act invocation in that instance as well. So um, I you know, pitched the book just as a sort of straightforward legal history. I had already uh, done a lot of the underlying research to you know, discuss that particular aspect of this and what it's, it could tell us about black, citizen, black citizenship and the unstable nature of it and how these insurrection, uh, you know, incidents or insurrection act incidents are sort of these markers that show, you know, uh, these sort of warlike flare ups mm -hmm. where, you know, the, there's an ultimate, you know, uh, battle over, you know, the full integration of black citizens into the larger citizenry, right? However, my editor, Elaine Mason at Norton, she, um, had read some other of my writing where I'm a lot more playful and just like, you know, probably irreverent, quite frankly, and <laughs> in which I have this hybrid style in which I mix and match, you know, um, your more sort of straightforward analytical or, you know, sort of uh, descriptive writing with something a little bit more personal, right? So she had asked me if I wanted to uh, write the book, this book that way. So I, of course I said yes, but then I had no idea how I was going to do it. Finally, when I, you know, got the, you know, the courage to, to actually make this attempt, I realized that I had to solve the problem of linking these insurrection act related incidents to some sort of other sort of personal narrative. Um, and so when I put the, the insurrection act incidents down in front of me and I saw that, you know, they were more or less, I could arrange them in chronological order, but in breaking down the material into chapters, I would have to find some kind of way of linking the personal narrative 
to the other material, legal history. So it wouldn't seem too dis disjointed. And the way that I found was through theme, like these underlying themes. And the, largely these themes have to do with emotions. So with the first chapter, which I just read from, the theme was fear. And you know, the, the starting off point was like the white larger, the fear in the larger white society of slave insurrection. But then there's, it, it kind of got into these other fears, like the fear of, you know, of the first black president, right? Of which we then suffered the, the, the backlash later, which I get on in, into the book. Uh, the fear that arose in me in seeing Barack Obama, you know, walk with the motorcade and being concerned that he might be killed. Um, you know, the fear, you know, obviously of the larger white society when it came to, you know, dealing with the, the, the question of, of slavery and the fact that, you know, they knew they were involved in uh, essentially, you know, a massive subjugation of, of uh, you know, humanity that could potentially uh, involve a backlash, right? But then you also have the fear of the enslaved person, right? They're not, I mean, they're, they must've been terrified. So I go through all of these, um, uh, I use fear as a way of ex exploring all of these different fears and in, in a way, hopefully sort of suturing together the Insurrection Act incidents with the personal narrative through the emotional content. I have no idea which question to pick. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, I'll, I wanna do actually like a little genre analysis move and just say um, what you're describing in, ter in terms of juxtaposing the personal narrative through theme with the legal history is first of all, so deftly and beautifully done. Like it's the rhythm of it is, is perfect. Like it provides just the right amount of like processing time for the reader. Um, and it also, it's also, pretty unique. Um, like from a literary history perspective, I'm like, I look at this book and I'm like, I don't know anything else like this really. Um, it has this, this pace, but what it's really revolutionizing, I think, is the way that history is written. And one of the things that sort of runs throughout this book, I'm also now like thinking about the Long Island scenes as also <laughs> being like the pref, the, like the, the prologue to the Hawa version of Get Out, like these <laughs> white families trying to chase out the black families. I mean, Long Island is a is a scene of horror in this book. Right. Right. Um, I totally want to talk about like Haiti and the rebellion in Santo Domingo, but like first let me yeah. ask you yeah. about history because you have a really sharp critique of, um, of how history is written. And you're drawing on some cool um, historical theorists in terms of situating the law within discourse, history within power, you're citing Du Bois, you're kind of sideways citing Hayden White, and you're, you're really, you're doing a new kind of history that takes this act as a lens for bringing up, you said this about your own experience of writing, I also had it as a reader, like all these separate events that I knew about, but couldn't thread together. And you found this gorgeous thread and you're telling history. Um, one of the ways that you talk about it is that in grade school and high school, you were forced to memorize names, dates, places, never the why. So this book is so much about the why and that's where the kind of emotional thread becomes really important. It tells us about the motives of white supremacy in right, defending right. a certain idea of America. So um, that's my like quick hot take on your like like new version of doing history, but like tell us, like how did you come up with this? It's insane, it's really good. Well, the thing is I knew, first of all, cause I, I don't have like a history background, which in, you know, in a way I was incredibly intimidated by, because I, as I confess in the book, I did never liked reading history. I never liked studying history. <laughs> so, you know, and here I am doing this legal history now, right? Using the law as a, as a, as a entering point, ent uh, entryway into this history. Um, but in, in doing that, I realized, you know, I have a lot of latitude and I guess uh, creative license to do all the things that you're not supposed to do. And one of them I knew is that you're not really supposed to speculate about how people were feeling, what are people, what are people's hearts and minds. Like we keep talking about hearts and minds and it's like, well, we don't know how they were feeling. We only know what they did and when they did it, what their name was, who else was there, right? All of these sort of like, you know, who, what, when, where, the why, you know, it sort of can be implicit in the, in the, the historical narrative, but I think when in the field of history and, you know, I'm a historian, a historian can correct me if I'm wrong, I, you know, there's a, it's a discipline. And in, within the context of that discipline, there's certain things that you're supposed to try to avoid doing. And I think one of them is 
you know, speculating into how someone was feeling without any evidence, right? And I know all about evidence coming from the legal field, right? You, you're, you know, that's the way that's the way lawyers work too. They have, you know, facts, relevant facts, and you know, you might have a, a certain, uh, you know, legal precedent that you can use to filter those, you know, facts down into what is, you know, considered relevant. But you know, there's, you're sort of bound to you're sort of what can be uh, sort of directly observed and the speculation is not up to you to really do although you do it in, you do it in a way that seem, makes it seem like what you're speculating about is actually factual like when you make an argument right so like you'll have a, a, a the plaintiff's attorney and then you have the defendant's attorney they have this they're using the same set of facts but they have wildly different arguments right mm -hmm. and they're speaking very forcefully and and definitively as if they have the objective truth so that's where i come about in the end talking about history you know obviously we know it's a narrative we, we know it's a story we, we understand you know issues around unreliable narrators and power and how that you know decides who you know whose story gets told whose story you know is is ignored how things are presented, but I, in the end, I say history is like an argument in that way. Um, it is essentially, uh, you know, sort of these these facts and names and dates and places, and strung together by this sort of uh, implicit narrative that we're supposed to maybe take for granted, and that in which that the one who's writing the history is pretending is not actually a narrative. Um, so this what I'm what trying to do is like be forthright about the fact that this I'm constructing a narrative, you know, and I, I, I say that all along the way. And it's trying to sort of expose various things like the, not only the shadowy emotions, but like the, the sort of the, the sort of creativity that comes in sort of presenting what happened. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is it's so genius to approach the the writing of history and you do such a beautiful job with this um like just giving the lie the idea that we're taking latitude in terms of speculation whereas like the inherited white history hasn't taken latitude doesn't come from an implotted subject position isn't situated in its own history doesn't have biases like all this like fantasy of objectivity you come at it like kind of like both from a meta historical perspective, but also I think this is the stroke of genius from a legal perspective where you're like, I actually disavow the function of facticity in the law. As you were just saying, we have, as lawyers, we look at the same evidence and produce different narratives about it. So like- Exactly. So I actually, so I do wanna ask you this question about your, um, what you call your existential antagonism to the law. Um, because I'm also like a hater and a spite motivated person. Like I do my discipline, but I'm like, I'm mostly yeah, motor my exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so like, like what is, eye. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the phrase one more time for the audience. So how I write's about having existential antagonism to the law. Tell us more <laughs> about that. And like, and also then mm -hmm. how you figured out a way to, cause this book also comes from a place of such profound love, like love for black people, love for the history that hasn't been told, love for the possibility of citizenship and freedom. Like how do you square those things and and um, how did it feel right. in writing? So it's like the existential antagonism. Like, I mean, as the thing is the other thing that I'm doing along the way and frankly, let me just say just outright there's no way you can plan to do this I, I was really solving a problem and then these 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 sort of ways of getting through it came out and, and i'm glad that they resonated with you um because it was just a very interesting how like in in telling this legal history and then interweaving the personal personal narrative i also decided to um you know basically give a side eye to the law <laughs> along the way i'm so glad <laughs> exactly <laughs> No, but essentially because, you know, as, as we're talking about disciplines, right? And it, there's something to be said about a discipline, right? You know, you, it has its, uh, its preferred uh, or standard methods and rules and generally accepted practices. And, you know, it's, it, you know it's, it, is, it serves its particular function. But what I found really frustrating as a law student, especially was how when you're dealing with the law, you're dealing with this uh, precedent that's sort of come down, you know, as if from, you know, people treat it as if, you know, it's like, the, you know, the, the word of God and, you know, it must be, you know, it's inviolable, etc. But of course, it's, it's the way in which we decide as a society, like, what, 
uh, actions are, you know, within the bounds of, you know, uh, acceptability, general acceptability and not, it gives it a certain amount of regularity in our interactions with others. So it serves its purpose, but, you know, it is ultimately a construction. And there's a way in which when you're in law school, in order to learn the practice of law, it, 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 there's, it's, it's almost like joining the military. It's like you're sort of broken down in order to be built back up. And you know that process, again, for the practice of a discipline is very useful. However, there's this other side of you that, you know, like that was the reason why you got into this in, this in the first place. And it ends up being sort of suppressed and silenced and sort of boxed up into this, you know, new package uh, and in which, you know, the, the very voice that, you know, you were hoping to make heard through this discipline is now muted and it can only speak through legal precedent or, you know, case law and, you know, this statute and that statute. Like, no, you know, it's not, it's certainly not about how you feel about anything. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what the discipline is. However, like I, you know, throughout, I try to not only, you know, talk about my own frustrations in that regard, but also um, talk about what the law actually is. Like we're not, we can't just take it for granted. And, and that, you know, I, I'm very, I'm indebted to the legal scholar, Robert Cover, um, who's, uh, you know, two essays I cite in the introduction and one is violence and the word. And he says, you know, law, you know, is not just like, you know, it's not like this, we have these, you know, written rules that, you know, people read and they follow, it's, it's essentially creates this construct in which, you know, uh, people very much understand that they don't follow those rules, that they're gonna be subject to some sort of negative event, some sort of enforcement event. And when he, call, he, he jumbles up all those events, whether you call them fines or, um, you know, prison sentences, right? Or, you know, uh, there's a various ways in which the law sort of like keeps you in check, right? And he, he calls all of that violence, essentially. You know, uh, it could be, you know, you know, you could be shot in the street, right? Like there are ways in which um, the law doesn't just operate as like this sort of neat set of rules that everyone follows, but people are constrained into following them through the threat of violence or the threat of, you know, enforcement actions, you know, that people are trying to avoid, in which case that's they decide to sort of discipline themselves accordingly. Um, so I, I was sort of bringing that out as well, like, like looking at law as its own construct, right? Because when you practice law, you're practicing from within the construct and you're pretending the construct's not there. But when you, uh, in this book at least, I, I step outside of it and then I see it and then I describe it as well. Um, you know, and that helps to sort of, you know, it helped me deal with my antagonism because these are things you're not allowed to do in the day-to-day -day practice by any means. It, it makes me wish that more smart lawyers took the time to step outside because the theorizing that you do of the law is incredibly useful, like not just for a, for a scholar, but for a citizen, like thinking how you um, describe those negative spaces within the law. I mean, I'm even just thinking of how, like the lovely work that you do with the language of the Insurrection Act, how, how kind of bombed out it is, like as you describe, insurrection isn't even really defined. Um, and there's like these incredible material co consequences. You just mentioned Cover's idea of enforcement. I was thinking about the way you talk about enforcement being by default placed in the hands of white people and white supremacists following the Fugitive Slave Act and, and in the kind of rise of the KKK. I'm thinking about like late, um, late in chapter three, I think. Um, when you're writing about that, but there's also just these cool conceptual shapes that you give us about, for example, peace as the absence of violence or um, what, I'm not sure I'm getting to a question here. I'm going a little bit No, off. no, I know what you mean, like, like, cause like the, the, the definition, it's sort of like defining terms as well. Cause like mm -hmm. we, we say words like peace, we say order, we use the term word law, but then what are we really talking about? Yeah. So it's useful to sort of break it all down and and really sort of understand, you know, these these sort of seemingly mundane and day to day terms in a in a sort of richer way that allows us to understand, you know, what our real interaction is with these concepts. Um, so I'm sorry, I feel I forget what you were 
starting well, your you're, I didn't I was not I didn't have a real question I was just like thinking through the gorgeous shapes that you've built but let's get to the order question because I do want to ask you um in the last couple of minutes about some like stuff that's happened since the book came out and since you finished writing it like and maybe this isn't even the last couple of months but I do want to ask you about this term that you just brought up which is order and to ask you to say a little bit more about how that word has been weaponized both historically um, and then how it's like extremely been weaponized um, since uh, the the inauguration of Trump and then especially after the January 6th insurrection. Um, there's a kind of second part to that question, which if it's more appealing to you to talk about is sort of connected and that's just about the kind of the weirdness of writing a book that can be like that has been um, I'm so happy to see um, because you have such enthusiastic readers, but like a timely book. Like you've been working on this book for years and years and you started your research on the Insurrection Act way before the glimmer of anything like the January 6th um, insurrection took place. So that's, I don't know if we wanna talk about that second question, but um, it is on my mind. Like, what does it feel like to write a book that people are reading as timely? And you're like, no, I I know, it's not. <laughs> I've been seeing that this was happening. <laughs> this is all, I'm also asking this is very personally motivated because I wrote this of epidemic course, that came yeah. out during the pandemic. Yeah, and pie, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so so in the first the first bit about order, there's a section in the book, I, I believe it's in chapter chapter five, where I talk about the civil rights uh, activists and civil disobedience and you know Martin Luther King's um, discussion about a peace either being negative peace or positive peace, or is it the absence of conflict conflict, or the presence of justice, all of that. So in the context, I talk about order because, you know, law and order. Um, typically in the proclamations, uh, you know, issued by the, uh, made by the president prior to making executive order in order to invoke, you know, the actual insurrection act through the, de the deployment of troops. There's always, uh, typically, there's a, refer ref a reference to uh, restoring law and order, right? So essentially, you know, because the law is almost like its own little shadow character in the book, um, you know, it's sort of understood that, you know, whatever the, the sort of legal construct has in place, like that's the order. So say prior to this uh, emancipation, you know, uh, and, and the sort of post-Civil War sort of uh, amendments, 13, 14, 15, the order was a sort of antebellum order that kept in place the, the, the system of slavery. So, you know, uh, the uprisings, the insurrections, the, the domestic violence were, were sort of implicated in the sort of disruption of that order. And it's not about the morality of the order. It's not, a, you know, it's not about the, you know, the ethical underpinning of the order, you know, um, it's about the fact that that's what the order was. Then you go, right. you, you fast forward, you know, we get this post uh, emancipation process and then we have a different order that is established through at least with respect uh, to African Americans is like the sort of like the sort of formal formal sort of uh, rights and the sort of formal freedom that has been afforded in the new legal order and that's where particularly during the civil rights movement you know mainly you start to see these invocations of the act that are used to sort of enforce that order meaning the um, you know, the, 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 the constitutional um, rights, you know, at, particularly after Brown v. Board with respect to the desegregation of public schools. And then in the case of the Selma to Montgomery March, you know, that, that was just regular First Amendment rights that were being, constitutional rights that were being enforced uh, and with respect to the march itself, but, you know, on the underlying them where this was this larger sort of civil rights crisis through, you know, challenging segregation, et cetera. But, you know, from, from the federal perspective, the larger order was one that recognized the formal rights of uh, black citizens. But of course, at that point, you know, you have that version of order, but then you have uh, about that version of restoring order, but then you also have the version where it's about suppressing uh, and quelling, you know, so-called race riots, which are born from, you know, uh, frustrations around police brutality, frustrations around, you know, um, you know, sort of poor housing and the sort of sort of urban, uh, you know, you know, settings post, you know, the Great Migration, where you have a lot of discrimination for with respect mm -hmm. to jobs and wages, housing, etc. Like, you know, and then you have these flare-ups, right? 
So that's where, you know, the, I, when I talk about the paradox of Black citizenship, it's like this instability of the Black citizen, which, you know, at the very beginning of the legal order, uh, you know, the term Black citizen was an oxymoron. You know, you fast forward, you know, and now there's like, you know, it's technically, being a Black citizen is technically, you know, uh, recognized, but then there's this sort of instability, which I, I see reflected in the invocations of the act. And I mentioned, and you might, I think you would appreciate this, like uh, Wittgenstein's duck rabbit, how you can look at an image and sometimes it looks like a duck and sometimes it looks like a rabbit, depending on your perspective and how the, it's like, there's this sort of uh, instability in terms of black citizenship, um, you know, being both, you know, uh, ward, I say an enemy of the state in terms of like the, the usages. Right. Of Act. Um, but in, in any event, like continuing to um, uh, sort of embody for, you know, the powers that be the sort of um, the legacy of that sort of in unstable, um, you know, uh, position of being both person and property, and therefore uh, being, you know, treated in this sort of dual manner, depending on um, you know, whether they were seen as a, th a threat to the larger order, right? So as property, you know, you're treated one way, it's like you're sort of an asset, an investment, you know, as a person, you're a potential insurrectionist, you know, who could overthrow the entire system, right? Um, but in any event, uh, fast forwarding to, you know, insurrection, right? Um, two things made it timely, not only this January 6th, drama but before that <laughs> I am actually going to adopt that as the technical term from now on because I have not been satisfied with any of the other ones <laughs> drama <laughs> go with drama yeah and I'll cite you well that's well you don't have to it's fine I mean you know it's just but the the in in the height of well yeah maybe the height or the the um around the beginnings I would say of the George Floyd rebellions in 2020 Donald Trump threatened to invoke the insurrection act in order to suppress those, you know, sort of national, uh, right. you know, you know, uprisings against police brutality. Uh, he did not end up doing it. But of course, when he threatened to do so, it was very clear to me as I was, you know, trying to write this book, I was like, wait a minute, like he's slotting right in to this pattern. You know, when I was reading those chapters of your book, I had forgotten actually that I can't remember if you were in New York also, but like I'd forgotten that day when he said he was sending tanks to New York. That's like we were what all was out. Like, it was like early June. Exactly. Because yeah. like, you know, there were some state governors who did, you know, use the National Guard in various respects, but Trump was going to step in and then, you know, become, he wanted to become commander in chief and then, you know, have a federal milita uh, military deployment right. in various states. I, mean, I think New York was one of the states he threatened, obviously, yeah. uh, Minneapolis and others. So, and, and in terms of law and order, again, you know, the law and order rhetoric, you remember it from, uh, you know, like Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew, and of course, George Wallace, the st you know, staunch segregationist Alabama governor. But then, you know, Trump sort of, you know, sort of reincarnated those, uh, I would call them vibes <laughs> in, in uh, his- The in worst his vibes <laughs> of all time. I'm gonna, drama, I'm gonna say vibes, it's okay. Um, in, in, in regards to the, the George Floyd protest. So, you know, the, one of the themes that I talk about in the book is that, and, and how I think about it in terms of personal history is how this history continues to repeat. It's like, there's this time loop where these themes, right. you know, continue right. to sort of rear their, their, their ugly heads. Um, I just want to, I, I want to take a quick break and say this is like an awesome time if you have questions, um, audience members, if you have questions and you want to put them in the um, Q&A, uh, we would love to hear from you how I would love to answer your questions. Um, and maybe I'll ask you one more to give people yeah. time to gather their thoughts, um, although I have <laughs> 8,000 more <laughs> questions. Um, we have to do this again. I know yeah. we should just keep doing it, even though, even if nobody can <laughs> talk on the phone about the book. Um, I think what I want, I think what I want to, um, like, especially hear more from you about is I'm thinking about it even a little bit in a new way than when I, than when I was thinking about it earlier today, which is this, um, like, I want to, I want to discuss relief seeking rioter as a kind of like parallel 
character to the paradoxical black citizen. Right. So there's that, cause that feels so, I mean, this is again, a like selfish question in a way, cause it feels so like the Muslim terrorist refugee mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of matrix and the legal status of the Muslim slash terrorist, um, which is something I've been thinking about for a million years. Um, but, but maybe also just to give you an opportunity to reflect a little bit on, um, yeah, like on this gorgeous paradox that you give us. So you talk about Black citizenship uh, like as paradoxical in part because of the naturalization of white citizenship, that citizenship simply emerges. It's, exactly. It is white. The concept of citizenship is white. Right. And so part of what I want to ask is just like, you know, what what is it that we can imagine? What can we hope for? What can we work toward in terms of fully enfranchised black citizenship, not as a paradox that lingers with this horrible haunting and specter of property. Um, on the other hand, I kind of want to ask in like a Sylvia Winter-esque vein, like following that gorgeous essay that she has no humans involved, which I was thinking about when I was reading your reading of Rodney King, like maybe we, like, do we, do we even want the category of citizen anymore co coming as it does from like, property owning white men in the Greek polis or are we like done with that shit like is there something amazing about the paradox the paradox let me not say right. there's right. nothing amazing right. about the specific historical paradox that black people in America inherit but right. is there something generative about the paradox as a concept that helps us to resist something like the violence and hegemony that's encoded in the very concept of the rights bearing citizen I don't know if that's too like heavy I, know, I totally I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about and I think when you said, you know, you know, amazing, you're like, oh, no, there's nothing amazing. But the thing is, there is something amazing, right? And it's the, um, it's, you know, okay, cheesiness, like, you know, the diamond that's created under pressure, right? Mm -hmm. That's what this is. Because on the one hand, yes, you have this system that is sort of bearing down, has all of these inherited, you know, toxicities that are sort of, you know, uh, you know, creating a pressure around, you know, what we call, you know, the, the black citizen. But on the other hand, there is this sort of, uh, you know, generative pushback, right? There's this agency, this, this attempt to carve out one's narrative agency, despite the intrusions of history. Um, and I think that is, creates so much, and this is the thing, this is not a book about black joy, like, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be books about black joy. I'm just, I just want to warn people, like that's not this book. I don't have a problem with the, with books like that. You know, I'm not- Can an I just interrupt though and say like, yeah. it, does, it does produce brown joy, just like report from <laughs> one reader. Like it's not about, but like <laughs> it yeah, makes so, it happen. I appreciate it. I mean, I, you know, cause I, cause it's like, I don't want to come across like I'm this doom and gloom person. However, um, you know, the, the, it's really about more so about, you know, the imposition of history, the imposition of law, the imposition of these sort of uh, larger cultural narratives in which the law is interpreted and, and through which history uh, is made and, you know, through which history is sort of, uh, you know, researched and understood. So it's more of like the sort of the, the constraint of the like social, um, you know, construction. It's almost like if you watch The Wire, how you're, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so depressing. Like, can these people get out of these situations or are they just doomed? But that's because that's that, that it's about the systems and the characters are sort of being used to animate, you know, how uh, corrupt the systems are, right? So this is that kind of book. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna say that I don't have hope, even though I, I, I use it in quotes and things like that, right? But it's, been mo it's more so because I'm trying to narrate something that seems, can seem normal, but is not really, uh, well, it is normal. Like it, it, it seems normal, it's normalized, but is in and of itself is sort of dysfunctional. So I'm trying to point to those things throughout. But in terms of what I think could be, you know, hopeful or useful in terms of, you know, the, the embodied, the fully embodied citizen, like in some ways, it's like when you don't, when you're not, you haven't been, you know, entitled to or granted or, you know, taken for granted as having the full rights of citizenship, citizenship you actually know what they are, right? Yeah. Because you're yeah. continuing to struggle to attain them. 
However, you know, the, the flip side is when you're in, when you have that entitlement, you you don't notice them until they're taken away, right? We're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of that now, quite frankly. Yeah. So and so that's that's uh, the difference. There's a sense that you know of, of taking something for granted and the entitlement versus understanding what it's like to to go without and having to fight and to struggle. And I think that creates uh, a, a fuller definition of citizenship as opposed to this uh, the one that you know is sort of oriented around like whiteness and, and exclusion and um, entitlement. So something like a, a thick citizenship as opposed to the like thinness of a right bearing, don't tell me to put what to put on my face. <laughs> right. Citizenship, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I do want to say for those who are interested in reading, just like, so you're not taken aback, like there is, a, there actually is a lot of optimism and joy in this book. I was particularly struck by how dreams come back again. And first of all, I love the recurrent dreams. I love the monopoly dream. I'm obsessed with so, it. Oh, because... I'm so glad. Okay. I'm <laughs> so good. I feel <laughs> I feel like you're describing one of my dreams. <laughs> okay, so let me just tell you guys, this is like this great story that Hawa is telling about having a dream of playing Monopoly with, with I assume, three white boys because the board has yeah, yeah. four sides and being given these like bum dice that don't work and then just like removing herself to go lay on the couch and read a book. <laughs> if that isn't a definition of thick citizenship, I don't know what is. Like you just like walk away from the real estate game and you like read by yourself. <laughs> the couch yeah especially after being lectured about how i'm doing it wrong yeah you know the dice i'm like this is clay like this is not even dice anymore what happened to the dice you guys were using you know it's just oh, those aren't free board. those aren't for you really you learn that as a summer game. associate in the law yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um but you also but, you also end with a dream you end with harriet tubman's dream you end with your own like idea about dreams um I don't know. I, I don't want to leave no time for questions. Uh, oh, it looks like we have one coming in. Before okay. I read this question, talk to us about just like those last dreams and maybe even like, what are you dreaming about now? Well, I mean, the dream motif, and I'm really glad you like that because that's one of my favorite things about it. It's sort of like woven in there, but you know, but the dream motif, obviously we have this thing called the American dream, right? And so I sort of return to this as like, you know, uh, there's this idea in terms of the narratives that we understand ourselves, like we each have our own sort of personal narratives. We're all, we're all kind of in our own walking dreams in a way, waking dreams. Um, and I wanted to use this concept of the American dream to sort of explore that, you know, because we have the, I talk about the American dream, I talk about the immigrant dream and the slight difference with that. And then there's, you know, maybe an African-American dream, like when you're thinking about maybe Langston Hughes's dream deferred, mm -hmm. right? But in a, and then of course we have Martin Luther King comes back with his I have a dream, you know, et cetera. But there's a way in which this idea of the dream, you know, in the way that certain like versions of history tend to be very sanitized. And, you know, there's this focus on freedom and equality, you know, um, without looking at the sort of underbelly, which I call like the sort of nightmare and the recurring nightmare, which is like these sort of unexamined, um, or under-examined and, and recurring um, sort of uh, dysfunctional aspects of the so-called dream that we keep sort of reliving as if that it, the way that you would if you were you were trying to work out something in an actual dream. Right, right? you're like stuck in a nightmare. You know, and then you're, it's like you keep having certain dreams over and over again because there's something you're trying to work out but you can't, you can't quite get to it and the things in the dreams are sort of symbols of those things but not the thing, right? So that's, that's an interesting way of also describing what you say in the book about your, about pattern recognition, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. how, how that's really what kind of keeps you going as a as a researcher. Like it's a seeing like, a, you know, I, I it, well, fully admitting that I don't necessarily know what's going on, but I can spot things that are familiar to other things. Right. It's sort of like a, that. But that seems dissimilar. It's like the yeah, it's like metaphor, essentially. Like it's, when you have a sort of mind that that can uh, create metaphors or spot metaphors or see things that are seemingly dis, uh, uh, dissimilar, but how they're the same, it's sort of using that at, at the sort of macro level through throughout the book. It's truly uh, of the many gifts that this book offers. It's one of the one of the top, one of the very best gifts. Like you, you are an insanely good recognizer of patterns and you're so competent and explaining them and like drawing people in. I, I wanna um, 
Barbara is saying a comment that I'm going to kind of turn into a question. So Barbara Coley says, I marveled at how you put the personal and analytical together, Hawa, especially significant for me were the snippets of your high school experiences. No questions come to mind, but I'm going to ask, I'm sure there are anecdotes on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. um, were there like scenes of like primal scenes of discovery that didn't make it into the book that you have been thinking about? You know, I did have in a sort of haphazard prior draft, I had scenes from uh, going with my father to Sierra Leone. And mm -hmm. I felt I, it was just, there were these things that I felt that should be in there, but I could, at the end of the day, I couldn't really fit it in. You know what I mean? It just didn't quite work. Um, but I, I did, because the thing is, I am a child of Sierra Leonean, you know, um, I don't like calling my parent, parents immigrants. It sounds annoying. But you know what I mean. People, Sierra Leone yeah, people. people. <laughs> you know what I mean, like the child of immigrants. But uh, so, um, and then you know, I'm talking about uh, the history of you know slavery and African African descended peoples. I felt like it was it's sh like that should make it in there somehow. It didn't mm -hmm. quite make it in there. Um, also, uh, on my dad's side, uh, the 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 tribe is Mende, and they were involved with the Amistad. Um, that try was involved with the Amistad sort of uh, ship overthrowing. And I, I felt like maybe that should make it in there somehow, but you know, you can't fit everything in there. Um, but if anything, I feel like it would they be- They keep more telling fun. me that, I refuse to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe it, it's nothing, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. It was just, there was too much, but uh, I really wish I could have, you know, woven in a bit more about sort of the, sort of at my African sort of, you know, ancestry um, mm -hmm. in a way more than talking about it in the context of immigration, but it is a book about the United States and, and law and, uh, uh, you know, United States law and United St uh, Black citizenship in the United States. So I guess that's fine. Um, the person who asked the question, Barbara, is is saying exactly what I also want to say, which is it sounds like you have the kernel for the next book. But <laughs> can can we give you just a second before we say good night um, to tell us if you are working on something new, I will, as you know, read anything you write. Um, but oh, for everybody thank in the you. audience, um, I, you know what, I'm not really working on anything actively. I have certain things sort of percolating, and quite frankly, a lot of them have to do with this idea. Like I'm, I'm like fund first and foremost, I'm really interested in in narrative and and personal narrative and narrative construction. And so I've been starting to think about just myths more generally, and you know how you know, people sort of understand themselves, but in the context of, you know, the, these sort of older myths that, you know, we call myths, right? We don't really call uh, what we think of stories myths, right? I don't know why we don't, why not? Mm. But I, I, you know, I've been thinking about that, but I, in a very kind of broad, kind of unfocused way, nothing, nothing really specific is coming to mind quite yet. But if it does, you know, um, I'll let you know in particular, you're such an, and can I thank you so much for this incredible conversation? Like you are such a great uh, conversation partner. And I really love the fact that you like really like liked the book. Like I can tell that you enjoyed I it. I love this goddamn <laughs> book. <laughs> it gives me so much joy because at the end of the day, like I know I'm talking about insurrection and like all these legal concepts and all these things, but I wanted it to be like, I, I just wanted it to be a work of literature. That was what I wanted. And I feel like, you know, it's really gratifying because you're, you know, a literature professor. And I feel like you're reading it, like you read it that way. And it's I'm just totally, so happy. It's totally revolutionary. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> and as I said, I'm a hater. So, you know, <laughs> I have to say that. Um, thank you for writing it truly. And I'm going to hold it up one more time. Everybody who's here, you have to get this book. Like, and, pro and probably you should give it to everybody you know. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation as well. And for all of you who know folks who maybe weren't able to attend tonight, we have recorded tonight's event so you can share the YouTube link to come. And thank you, Hoa and Anjali for the conversation. Thank you so much, Kay. Thanks for having us and organizing. Have a great night. Yeah, absolutely. Purchase Insurrection, Rebellion, Civil Rights, and the Paradoxical State of Black Citizenship at both of our locations and on our website. Have a good night, y'all. You too. Thank you.
Good night, everyone.